Welcome. Welcome everybody to this uh, session of KIFI, Scientists for Future and Studium Generale. Um, I'm very happy to see you all back in the theater again after this long, terrible COVID period. Um, tonight we're also live streaming. Welcome to the viewers at home. I don't know which camera uh, you're watching, but welcome. Um, you can ask questions via the chat, so please type them in. We have uh, two students from uh, Kifi students, Matthijs Boon and Jorn de Jong. They will collect all questions and send them to me, so I can ask them to Will, uh, Sean or Diederik. So please r uh, bring in your questions. Um, as you probably know, 2021 is European Year of the Rail. That's an important year and a very good reason to discuss our European rail network system. Um, most of you probably love to travel through Europe, see cities, things like that. Um, but at the same time, you want to do it in a sustainable way. So flying to Rome for a weekend feels a bit, doesn't feel good. Um, the train is a sustainable alternative, but I looked it up. Amsterdam Rome will take you about 20 hours. Uh, a couple of changes will can explain more about this and it probably costs you twice as much as EasyJet. So it's still a dilemma. This leads us to tonight's big question. Is it possible to have a fast, sustainable and affordable railway system in Europe that can compete with air travel? That's the central theme. Luckily, we have three experts in the field who can guide us through this complex world. Let me introduce them to you. We start with um, Wil van Roy, uh, you will kick off this, uh, this session with some historical backgrounds. Uh, Will is a self-employed rail consultant and he worked for, just to mention one uh, of his achievements, for NS uh, International, where he was responsible for the night trains. So if someone knows how to operate a complex network, it's, it's Will. Secondly, we have, I'm very happy to announce, uh, the ProRail CEO, John Foppe. Welcome, John. Um, you could just manage to, to get here to Enschede, but I'm very happy you're, you're here. Um, John is the manager of the Dutch railway infrastructure, and he is responsible for one of the world's busiest uh, rail networks. That's important to keep in mind. And uh, nice to know, John is born in Enschede, and he studied at this university, technical management, so it's also some kind of home run for you. Welcome uh, to this session. And last, certainly not least, Diederik Samsom. He is probably online right now or is busy getting online. Um, but Diederik Samsom will um, reflect on the European perspective. That's also very important, of course. How do you get all European countries on one track in order to get a good rail system? Uh, Diederik is highly involved in the European Green Deal. Um, and that's a very ambitious project to make Europe green and sustainable. And of course, rail traffic is one of the cornerstones of this Green Deal. Um, and I mentioned that Diederik chairs the cabinet of EU Commissioner Frans Timmermans. That's his job these days. He will join us online, but he will be here. He will hear the talks of Bill and, and Sean, and uh, he will be with us. Enough talking and introduction. Will, the floor is yours. Let's get started. Switch on the mic. And I want a big hand for now? Will. Yes, it does. Yeah, Wonderful. you're you're uh, you're in yeah. the air. Yeah. I okay. Guess I'm understandable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Go ahead. Now this should work, I believe, but I'm not quite sure it what. <laughs> That's always wonderful, right? I don't I don't dare to touch one of these buttons because I don't know whether my presentation will still run as it should. Um, that's weird. Uh, let me see. <laughs> How does this work? We had them, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Sorry. Uh, that's very strange. There should be some... I'll get a smart technician. That's better. Better idea. <laughs> Simon, can you well, uh, help us? Want it gaat the hemel is. I can start with introducing myself. This is Simon. Simon, very important person 
back doors behind the screens responsible for the live stream. Wow. And he knows and as all you can see, very well Bible. prepared. My name is Will van Roor, uh, as if I didn't know there that. There we are. Okay. Simon, thank you. Okay, Will van Roor. I've been working with Dutch Railways for, for quite a long time, um, and in that time I'm responsible for the operation towards the south. So basically that were all the train connections between the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and the UK, except for Thales. Alice was a different contract and was kind of complicated, so that was separated from, from basically from the original operation of NS International. But this was only one of my jobs. I've been doing a dozen, and if there are any people from NS or probably in, in the room, uh, most likely we have met before. Um, since 2019, I'm self-employed, um, and uh, I want to mention that I'm a member of the Key View Rail, I'm a member of the board of Key View Rail, and I really I hope that this discussion today triggers you all to become a member of Key View. And if you're not, uh, be, please become a member of Key View and sign up for Key View Rail, of course. Well, that's my commercial part of the talk, and uh, now let's get to the technical challenges. Um, in order to understand the presentations of Jean and, and Diederik later on, I think it's, it's good uh, to draw a perspective of all the technical challenges and the preconditions uh, that are, have to be set. If you want to understand the challenges the railway community is facing, it's wise to understand how things were. Um, our ancestors chose solutions for their challenges given the available and affordable technology. For example, in the Netherlands, we started quite early with electrifying the network, but then DC was state of the art. While it is now seen as old-fashioned, ineffective, etc. Um, and as you can see uh, on this on this small map here, you can see a, a European map uh, showing all the different uh, overhead line uh, uh, voltages. And uh, well, it's it's a uh, it's quite different. So we got one and a half volts or one and a half. KV in, Bel in, in the Netherlands. Parts of France also have, wonderfully enough, one and a half KV DC. Belgium's three KV DC. Germany has got a different system. Or oh, you can see that the German influence in, in Switzerland and Austria is effective because they've got the same system. But it's not the European standard. Okay. So, um, Every country, basically every country, had its own solutions because railroad operation and railroads were basically a local thing. So the first ambition and the first goal for these railroad companies to, was to accommodate national transport and not necessarily international transport. Um, now I get to the core of my story. Imagine, it's 1980, and you want to travel from Amsterdam to Rome. And by explaining you how this trip would be organized and how it will be in place, you understand what are the necessary changes um, in order to make railroad, international railroad travel more effective, more appreciable, uh, more competitive, probably more affordable as well. It starts with a European timetable. You can't run a train without a timetable. And imagine in the 1980s, under the supervision of UIC, uh, and a friend of mine in Germany calls it um, Kaninchen Zuchtverein. Now, basic, basically, UIC is an organization that represents uh, transport companies, uh, railroad undertakers. Not the infra managed, they got their own. Oh, they are, I guess you're part of UIC as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. okay. So UIC is, is, is a bond of, of different railroad companies throughout Europe, and probably the bigger Europe. Um, and in the UIC headquarters in Paris, with a beautiful view on the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, they would discuss the timetable. And they would do it in a couple of stages, um, aligning more and more the timetable. Uh, but the French and the Germans would probably 
dictate how things were done and how they should be done. Because they had the biggest countries, they had the biggest contribution in locomotives, in sleepers, coaches, uh, whatever, you know, all the rolling stock that is necessary to operate international trains. Well, once the table, timetable was ready, it was printed in books. Um, or people that are a bit older know them still, telephone books. You know, these thick, thick books with probably more than a thousand pages in it. Um, and they were printed and they were distributed to the sales offices and probably to everybody that needed an international timetable. So, you wanted to go from Amsterdam to Rome. Go, you would go to the international ticket office and you would have a chat, probably with a lady. Most of the people that worked in the sales offices from international were ladies. And she would interview you. And what do you want? You want a sleeper, you want to have dinner, uh, how fast do you want to train, uh, travel, is it first class or second class, um, etc. And she would, it would be her pride and honor to give you the best possible solution and the best options that would, she would figure them out for you. And you would leave the ticket office, probably a few guilders or euros lighter, with a booklet. And the booklet was for each and every train you would take during your trip. You would get a separate ticket indicating the time, the train number, probably the reserved seat or the reserved bed. Um, and you, that's, that's the way you would. So on the day of departure, you would, you would go to Amsterdam. Um, you would be welcomed by a huge crew of staff. There would be someone from Wagon Lee, someone from Metropa, which is the dining, uh, the dining car, uh, probably uh, the, 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 the normal train crew, like the, the, the conduct, conductor, I don't know the English word for that. The guard, the guard. OK, right. So the guard and the train driver, of course. Um, so there would be a crew of, let's say, I don't know, five, maybe 10 people would, would host an international train. Well, at the right time, oh, and if you would pay attention, you would, uh, you would see that on this train, on the different coaches, there were different indicators where the train would go. Uh, there would be coaches that would go as far as Basel, or some would go as far as Milan. Uh, maybe there would be even other directions, I don't know. Well, once the train would leave, it would leave uh, the, the platform. Um, you would go, would stop in Utrecht and Arnhem. You would go to the German border. And that would be the first long stop. The locomotive would be changed. So the Dutch locomotive went off and the German locomotive came on. Uh, the train crew would change. It would, the Dutch crew would be changed by a German crew. All in all, or probably customs would come aboard as well. They would check your passports. So all in all, it would take you probably an hour, maybe, maybe even longer, I don't know. And the journey would continue. Um, oops, sorry. Um, Well, the same procedure as we had in Emmerich will take place at the Swiss-German border, and probably the same procedure will take place at the Swiss-Italian border. And in the meantime, at the big, big stations like Frankfurt or Cologne or Basel, uh, the train would be separated and coaches would be taken out and new coaches would be taken in, put in place which would come from whatever, Warsaw uh, or Berlin or... So the connection Berlin to Rome was at the last stage from Basel to Rome would be a combined operation. Well, there was only one advantage. If you booked a trip from Amsterdam to Rome, where the co you, had, you had a coach in Amsterdam with a Rome destination, you wouldn't have to change trains anymore. You could stay in the train all the time. 
But imagine, um, it's quite lengthy. Uh, it would take you probably 48 hours to get from Amsterdam to Rome. An average speed of, let's say, um, maybe this is a nice picture for that, an average speed of 40, 45 kilometers an hour. Um, not to mention that it would be quite expensive as well. Well, if you, it's only 40 years ago, right? I've, 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 been, I've seen that, I've been there, I've done that. I was an interrailer, probably quite a few of you guys have done interrail as well. Uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Just gentlemen, you didn't. Well, I did, and I enjoyed it very much, but... <laughs> okay, sorry for you. It was big fun. Because, well, anyway, it didn't matter. We had the time, you know, and we were very eager for comfort, so we would sleep in the second class, and we would combine chairs to make a bed, so we didn't really, we didn't care. It was cheap, so it was so cheap that we, we could afford it, and it would bring us all over Europe. Um, but looking at it from a perspective of nowadays, um, it's not a way to travel um, as, as you would want to travel. Okay, what's the current status at the moment? Um, the trip isn't as lengthy as it was. Uh, you, uh, Peter, Peter just mentioned roughly 15 to 20 hours uh, from Amsterdam to Rome. Okay, that's okay. But you would have to change trains at least five times. Instead of staying on the train, you have to change trains. What does that do for your comfort? How vulnerable is this operation? How uh, vulnerable for delays? You know, imagine, imagine you miss your train. You know, you get a delay in the first train. Uh, your complete journey is jeopardized. Because if you miss one, you miss them all. So, it doesn't look very attractive still. Oh, and you can't buy a, a ticket in the internet. You can, you can find in the internet, you can find the, 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 the options there are for traveling from Amsterdam to Rome, but you can't buy a ticket. You still have to go to a ticket office or ask, ask a ticket office for you to make a reservation and you should pay them, etc. Yeah. But, okay, it's better, you know, 15 hours instead of 48 hours. Uh, you can l find there are multiple options, whereas there used to be only one or two. But this is not where we want to be. Um, so, one of the ambitions. The trip must be booked by internet. That sounds reasonable, right? Multiple options every day. Um, an affordable price, comfortable and reliable. Realistically spoken, there's a limitation of the length of the train trip. In average, a maximum of eight hours, I would say, or 500 or 750 kilometers. Uh, I guess that's the maximum for international train operation. And so in that sense, the Rome example wasn't a good example, but well, it's, it sounded so attractive from Amsterdam to Rome, right? Rome is, is a beautiful city. So those are the challenges. So um, what are the solutions? And, and now I get a bit to the technology. Um, first of all, a very practical issue. Our network in the Netherlands is fully loaded. Imagine there are two tracks between Utrecht and Arnhem, and uh, we're up to a six trains per hour system that will be in place from Nijmegen to Amsterdam uh, in one or two years, I guess. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but if that, that happens, um, you would have like 10 trains per direction per hour. Is there room for an international train? for a regular international train um, and freight trains as well. So, uh, it, yeah, the network is quite loaded. Um, will the railroad crossing go ever, ever, ever be open? Is the power supply capaci capacity big enough? Uh, where to store all these trains? You, know, you can see here a shunting yard, you know, it, it's completely loaded. I, I, you know, there is a discussion between NS and Prora on, on the number of uh, and, and the size of the shunting yard. Um, in my time when I was, I was I, in one of my previous functions, I was responsible for the, for the, for the, for the operation in northeast of the Netherlands. And we had, a, we had an operation, uh, I think I get a signal. 
<laughs> Did I do something? Sorry. I'm just looking at the screen, yes. so for me, nothing changed. Oh, uh, Simon. Uh, Simon, he's, uh, he's our technician, right. Um, okay, Simon will organize that. Um, but looking at these, the, the, so that, that are just the domestic challenges. Then on an international level, and probably not only the only domestic challenges. No, it's the, the previous one. Yeah, okay. Um, on an international level, it would be ELTMS. Uh, and I think, I think we're well on our way. Uh, it's hard, it's difficult, it's, it's complex. But I guess our next speaker will... Uh, say a bit more about that. Then we got the overhead voltage, you know, the, so the overhead line voltage. Uh, I think it's impossible to to change that. You know, if you if you would change it, it would require uh, that you have to change all your rolling stock, so all your locomotives. So multi-current locomotives and train sets are fine, I guess. I wouldn't change that. Um, and then something stupid like a platform height. Uh, it's not a European standard platform height. Uh, it must be, but imagine, and for international train operation, it's not a big deal, but imagine you're stuck to a rail, rail, rail chair or wheelchair, uh, then it is a challenge. Uh, and then, of course, the ticketing, um, that must be done through the internet. Um, so, it can't be done all at the same time. Um, and... Uh, as you can see from this picture, um, I guess the biggest challenge, but uh, John, I guess you get to that point. The biggest challenge is that the present operation is a 24-7 operation. And to be ready for the future, it takes quite a lot of change. And to, to integrate the present operation 24-7 with all the changes necessary in ATMS, in platforms, in capacity, that is quite a challenge, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge of all, because I guess the technology can be mastered. Um, although that keeps developing as well. And we had a previously, uh, we had a discussion that, um, I didn't mention it, but you know, of course the 5G, Internet of Things, uh, data-driven maintenance, you know, all these subjects, of, of course, all these general technological developments have to take place as well and have to be integrated in, in the entire system. That brings us me to the last slide. And hey, finally we get there. We get to Roma, Germany. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Will. I was a bit too late, right? So no, it's, it's okay. A big hand for, um, for Will. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It was very nice sharing nostalgic images and the thick booklets which you needed to tra travel through Europe and the challenges you, uh, you talked about. Um, I suggest that, we, uh, that people keep the questions in mind um, and that we do them in the final Q&A uh, session. Um, so I would like to invite John Foppe to the floor. John, let me see where your presentation is, but otherwise we got splendid... You get someone to help? It's no problem. We, we, we no, I think we, I... I can manage, yes. This looks, yours is a bit more <coughs> easy to find. So, this is the pointer. John, are you on your mic's on? Let me try, can you understand me? Ah, that's very nice. Okay, <coughs> go Just ahead. Take it back. So, for a number of reasons, I'm really happy to be here and to have the chance to stand here. And uh, I'm. I'm working at ProRail at this moment. It was, uh, it was announced before. I'm the CEO of ProRail, and, but I'm also the vice president of the European Info Managers platform. That sounds really nice. All the European titles sound fancy. So I do a lot in Europe. I do a lot in the Netherlands. And I have worked for ProRail now for 16 years. But there's another reason it's very special for me to be here today. Because I think it was on this side, in the small room, where I graduated. And on this university, and it was... It feels like yesterday, but it was 26 years ago. And um, there is one thing of my study I like to share with you, and that was my graduation assignment. Because uh, well, when you study, I, I studied technical management, so I'm an engineer, not, not a real one, yeah, but like a management engineer. Who, who, who's studying technical management here? Okay, <laughs> 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 I got the point. Um, 
I, I studied that and uh, I, I learned a lot about, uh, in the technical management studio at that time at the University of Twente, you learn a lot about technical things. And then it seems like the world was makeable. So you could make all the things you like, the technical possibilities, what you had. But I also learned a lot about the social, social shark and how, how people behave and how they work together and how the collaboration is. So I got a re really diverse study. And then I went to Shanghai to do my graduation in a steel company over there. And I tried to introduce budgeting. It was not a Chinese word, so it was really difficult. But I learned one thing about China, and that is that they can really make the things they want. And they can make them quick and easy, and it goes really, really quick. And uh, at that time, I was living in Shanghai, and uh, every, every, every week I came back, the building was growing. And when I was going away after four or five months, they, ra they raised the whole building. And they're doing the same with trains, with high-speed trains. It's amazing. They built high-speed trains faster than we do uh, a small adaption of our network. And I always think about how can it be. C keep that question in mind. And I'm 100% sure it's not about the goals. It's not about the objectives, but it's about a different way of collaboration they have in China. And that's one of the key points of my presentation today. I'm not going to talk too much about technical things. I like, I love the technical things. I love the operation. I've been the director of the rail traffic control in the Netherlands, so I really love uh, the product. I think Will gave us a really nice introduction, but maybe it left you a little bit with a lot of challenges. It didn't really work in 1980, and it doesn't really work right now, the international travel. Yeah? It's all the challenges we have, but I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful, and I'm full of ambition, and this is, if, if there's one moment in time where we could make international rail travel work, it's this moment. I think we are really in the good shape uh, to, make, uh, to make that happen. And what we, what, what, we, what we see now that, well, let's be fair about it. Uh, uh, air traffic, international air traffic is booming since the 1950s. And international rail traffic is trying to become the next stage. And I think, well, I don't know you at all, but I think some of you have a dream of the future. And some still think back of those old days <laughs> where we have these nostalgic rides and think, Maybe it's a bubble which will burst uh, very, very short. And it's not about the goals, because the goals are very clear. And I think Diederik will tell you even more about that. But the first goal is really simple. In Europe, we need sustainability. We need sustainable growth. We are growing, and we need sustainability. And the train is part of the solution. It's that simple. If we can have more trains, we will have a, a really good eff uh, 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 effect on uh, both um, the growth and both the sustainability. The European Green Deal, the, uh, the we, we, will, we can, if we have all the flights in Europe below 750 kilometers, if we make them to rail, we can annually have a CO2 reduction, a reduction of 2 to 8 million in Europe. That's, that's the same number than the CO2 we want in uh, what we want. And the last part is, and we can have the discussion will afterwards. Uh, I still think we have a lot of possibilities in our network. So we have a nice network, and of course Will is right, because he knows so much about this, and it's, there's a lot of trains in the Netherlands, but we still have capacity. And if we connect all these international uh, rail uh, networks, we can have a lot of international trains. So it's not that the goal is not clear, but we have to change the collaboration, and the collaboration in Europe is essential for that. And the one thing now is the Green Deal, the sustainable growth, that's the, how do you say, the motor, that's the drive behind that we are at this moment at the possibility to increase the international uh, rail. And there are technical obstacles. So let me tell you also a little bit about that. Because it's a patchwork. Uh, uh, we'll show you the electricity. I can tell you the same about the, 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 the traffic control systems. I can tell you the same about the, the, the EOTMS systems. So EOTMS is the future, but now we have all these different systems in, uh, in Europe. And I can even tell you it about the language, because in the, in the Netherlands we speak Dutch, in Germany we speak German, and even a simple thing like the English language, uh, we did not uh, come to that point at this, uh, at this moment in time. And it's not only the technical barriers, because you also have the national safety organizations. We have a national safety organization in the Netherlands, we have the one in Germany, we have the one in Belgium, and if you buy a train these days, and you have um, the train approved in Germany, and you bring it to the Netherlands, then you have to prove it in the Netherlands again. And if you're unlucky, then you have to prove it in Germany again. So 
my point is, it's not the technical part, because Will is right, we will not harmonize all the kinds of things. We never go back to a greenfield situation. We cannot do what aviation did, so we must not strive to have a technical same system in all the countries in Europe. I, I, see no, I see no way how we can move that fast that way. Yes, we will do with ETMS, but we will not have it in Europe before 2050, 2060, and then it's too late anyway. But even with the technology we have now, right now, we can build um, locomotives where we have the different technologies. We have this locomotive. We have the locomotives, we can have the different voltages, with the different safety systems, so we are there. But we need to improve in procedures, in uh, collaboration, working together, have one European system for uh, approving trains. That's the kind of steps we really have to make uh, to come forward. And in that way, all the countries have to think international. And if you think about your natural interest, it's going to be very difficult. I will give you ex some examples, some very practical examples later on. And the interesting part of this is that the Netherlands is an excellent country to lead the way. We are the example in many ways. How we do the collaboration in Europe, how we do the, the, the high standards. We still have the highest punctuality in Europe. It's always a bit tricky because the Swiss are sometimes a little bit ahead. But most of the times we are a little bit ahead. We have the most trains on our network. So we are also in the position in Europe nowadays, uh, which was different, uh, I think, 20, 30 years ago with uh, Germany and France, to make a difference in this international uh, Train, uh, train business. And <coughs> what you see about this collaboration, I don't think, if you, if you think about government structures, I don't think there will ever be uh, a European railway company or something like that. That's not the way it will go. And in my opinion, eh, we can discuss about it when we have the discussion. I think it's a big, it, it's, it's a step too far away. Um, and, and if we have all the international trains we would like, then still 80 to 90 percent of the railway traffic will still be national traffic. Because also in the Netherlands, it's 50 to, 80, it's 50 to 70 percent of the commuter trains, of commuter uh, um, mobility, is not cars, but it's still trains. So the, the national trains will still be very important for that. And what we have to do, and I think it's a little bit of repetition, uh, what Will said, but sometimes repetition is good, we need to have one ticketing system in Europe. So you can just buy the ticket uh, on the, uh, on the, that will not be, that cannot be that difficult. At least it will not be that difficult as ETMS, I think. We will need a virtual European traffic management. So there will be, not be one European organization which all will have uh, the traffic management together because that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works in aviation either. But there will need some coordination mechanisms. and We will have a virtual network. I, I can see it before me how it works in this area. But what we do need to do, and that's quite a big step, is we need to work on timetabling. And we need to do a paradigm shift. And I will tell you a little bit later about that, but that's Eurolink. But that's, that's one of the things we have to do. International first, national second. And that's, that's the way we should go with the timetable. But this timetable will be far away. We have also... We have also wins in the here and now. So, for example, we have the air rail action uh, calendar. We do it together in collaboration with KLM, Schiphol, uh, NS, uh, ProRail. So we're not working against aviation, but we work together. And what we, uh, what we can do now is on destinations as Brussels, uh, Paris, uh, uh, Frankfurt, München, Berlin, all different countries, we have a very good international uh, 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 train going. And we also have a big success because we stopped a, a few flights from Brussels to Amsterdam. And what, what KLM and we did together is that we now have combined tickets. You can buy a ticket and you can first sit in the train and then you can get the plane or the other way around. So we're moving away this 500 or 700, all these destinations we can, we can move away. And, well, if, uh, if I'm not speaking the Netherlands, we, they always call this the polder model, eh? how we do the polder, polder way of doing things. But that's the way I think it's done in Europe uh, these days. And what we also see is one of the, one of the, one of the best, uh, best things we are working on is the Eurostar. Because London is, if we want to save on CO2 emission, London, Amsterdam is the best solution. Stop flying, take the train, you can work on the train. But this Eurostar is, is really successful. But we don't, we don't have the Eurostar every hour. So yes, I agree, the network is full. But those international trains sometimes don't even go every hour. I and mean, in, in, the, in the Netherlands, we have 
the same schedule every hour, so there's still room for more Eurostars. The frequency can go up. And I will tell you later, it's when I talk about uh, the timetable, that we can also win 20 to 30 minutes on the Eurostar. And what we do is we stop, we stop the trains to Germany, we stop the trains to Paris, we try to stay, stop them at Schiphol, we change these kind of things, we, we try to stop the train from London at Schiphol. That sounds very easy. It's not that easy because uh, Schiphol we have a tunnel, in the tunnel is a station, we need a separate room where we can do the passport and you, you, because you don't want to change because it's Brexit. So everything has to change, but we can do those kind of things and we will do those kind of, these kind of things. And let me tell you a little bit about Eurolink. Eurolink is the initiative we take in EIM, this so, uh, the European Infra Managers, to reschedule the timetable. And if you do the international timetable first and then do the national timetables, you can win a lot. To give you an example, the Eurostar can win 30 minutes. It stops in Brussels, it has to change. There is some other local train uh, just across the border in France which has to go first. Well, some people here know much more about it, but let's be a little bit careful to give the example too much detail. But it's a mind shift. It's a, it's a different way of thinking. Putting the national, ne your, your national interest second and put the international first. And I think if we make that change, we can make a big jump and we should be able to do it. Yeah? Because so difficult, uh, it's not that difficult to do that. And we also uh, need some time for this international timetable. It, it will take three to four to five years. But we also have short-term uh, benefits, like the night train to Vienna. We already have it back. We go that way. Uh, also, Amsterdam Munich, by just connecting two different trains, now together we can have a much more seamless uh, uh, train, uh, train drive from uh, Amsterdam to Munich. And in this way, we, we can make those goals happen. And if we have, on one hand, the drive, well, Diederik will tell you much more about it, the drive from, from, from the sustainability, that the train is part of the solution on one hand, and the kind of practical solutions which do ask for a collaboration in Europe, I think some pressure, but let's discuss that later on, yeah, because all the national interests, all the personal interests will not go away at once, not only by the goals, so we need pressure together, but let's uh, do the discussion. Then we can make it happen. We can make it happen that the flights uh, 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 under the 750 kilometer go away, that we have to train, that we have the 55% reduction of CO2 in 2030. I really think we can make those kind of steps. And we can, uh, uh, and we can have this European dream and this, this, this step we all want. And this is the moment, because now we have the opportunity. I'm glad that Diederik is uh, coming after me. Diederik Samsung uh, is uh, one of the persons behind the Green Deal. And, uh, well, he will be inspirational, I'm for sure. And he's one of the keys to make it happen, because Europe ha really has to uh, help us uh, making this dream uh, reality. And uh, I also will invite Diederik, he's not here, but I do it virtually, Diederik, for the train. We have a special train to the climate top in uh, Glasgow, because it's the only way to go to the climate top in Glasgow, that's by train. And, um, and uh, uh, Frans Timmermans will be there himself, so uh, we will go that way to Glasgow, and, um, and we will have this way of uh, uh, European international travel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, John Foppe. Um, Diederik is listening to us. Diederik, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. Sure. we can hear you loud and clear. So that's very nice. Uh, you're invited to the Glasgow train together with Frans Timmermans by, um, by John Foppe. So I think that's a very intriguing invitation for you. Um, and Sean Foppe told us about the pressure coming from Europe. We need a little bit of pressure to get the, the railway systems better. I think you can say a lot about these things. So um, I leave the floor to you. I have to watch to that camera. I think you can see me now. But um, I want a big hand for uh, Diederik Samsung. You can't hear it, but make sure it's a, a big applause. Go ahead. <laughs> Not sure what I can do with you. Uh, there's a little echo in the in the system, uh, which makes it difficult for me to talk. But I will give it a try anyway, and I will be brief because I see we are running over time, eh? just like normal trains. Um, I want to take you back to uh, one of my favorite movies. It's the film Back to the Future, in which Marty McFly takes a train. It's a very old-fashioned one. Uh, you know that one from the Wild West, and he travels in time. He travels to the future, 
with that very old train. And that's exactly the movement that we see today, or actually that we need to see today. We need to design a future transport system that is ready for a clean future. Across Europe, politicians and businesses are looking for a trusted transport mode with a romantic past. It's the train. Uh, the boosting of a rail is, I think, one of those rare parts of our big European Green Deal that unites the young and, let's put it uh, sophisticatedly, the less young or the old generations. Because the olders, uh, they like to revive their past where they would take a night train across Europe, you remember? And the young, they see it as the smartest and the best way to move around in a climate-friendly manner. And it's therefore no coincidence that rail is at the backbone of our vision for transport, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy that we brought out last year. The strategy is even called, literally, putting, Europe, putting European transport on track for the future. So that should make the heart of any train lover and I'm firmly one of them, to be a little faster. But of course, to really treat the train as our future for transport across our continent, uh, passions and dreams are surely not enough. We need concrete actions to make that vision a reality. And this year, it's, by the way, the European year of the rail. Uh, we need to finish a year of passion for the train, and we need to turn it into concrete actions and actions we committed to, and there will be. This autumn, so in a few months' time, or a few weeks' time, dependent on the timing, is always difficult within this commission, but the commission will present an action plan for passenger rail, an action plan for passenger rail. And this will follow up on the work that we already did and that national governments did in Europe itself to take those decisive steps towards a revival of Trans-European Train Express. The member states and the rail operators will identify, and they're already busy, to get that network off the ground, that network that brings you to Rome, not in 48 hours, but in much less, maybe less than 12. And the results, I'm always an optimist, I expect them soon. And the commission, after that identification of all those bottlenecks, the commission will then follow up with our action plan uh, to take away those bot bottlenecks, because that's our commitment, that's our promise to Europe to assist wherever we can to boost the train across Europe. And the Netherlands, by the way, they took the lead in calling for this plan, and maybe Mr. Foppe did. And that's a good thing, because that, I mean, what, what wasn't lacking in the past in Europe was the will or the intentions, the good intentions, I should say, to remove all those bottlenecks and to ensure that trains can travel seamless cross-border. What's more logical than that? Uh, but even with all those good intentions, only 8% of passenger transport over land is by train. 18% of freight by land goes by rail we can and we should do much better than that. So enough of the good intentions. What was lacking was a European spirit, a European way of thinking in the member states. And, and I talk to some of you directly now, and within the rail companies themselves, to think real European when they design their network, to look beyond their national train islands and to connect them with a train that connects the major European cities and fast. So this initiative from member states and industry could be a watershed moment. Let's make use of that. In our mobility strategy, we promise to help with at least 15 pilots for fast and easy to use train connections between major European cities. That's the lowest common denominator, 15. If there's more member states want to do, we can do that too. And it should actually be more than 100 if you look at the big cities of Europe and all those connections. The intention is that we look at those routes and we start working on them in a European way by aligning the national timetables into a European timetable. What's more logical than that? If you go buying an, an, an air ticket, you, you look at the whole system. If you want to buy, and it's already said before by the former speakers, if you want to buy a train ticket, you buy them by country, country by country by country until finally you are in Rome. 
by make, um, what we should do is we should also use the digital technology that we have, obviously, on the train itself, the uh, ERT, uh, ERMTS system, but also by doing something about one of the major issues that is holding our train to bookings back. Identified before, and it's really a major step that we need to, to put forward, <laughs> one that is way overdue. Because easy train ticketing across Europe is our priority. Our goal is pretty simple. Look at what happens with planes, and we need to do the same for trains. We have to make finding and booking a train as easy as booking a flight. Everyone who, who has traveled by train knows how difficult that is to find and book tickets and compare to flights. Flights even appear on top of the sustainable transport booking options with carbon offsets, which we know is not true. So if you go on a website and you wanna, and you wanna have a sustainable transport mode, what you get is a plane with carbon offsets. That's deceit. That's not real sustainability. A train, that's real sustainability. So this fall, we will make the first step to make that easy ticketing happening this fall. We will revise our, it's called with a difficult name, Intelligent Transport Systems Directive to have a standard European approach to the availability of travel data of high quality. And that will be followed up because that's just the first step. We need to follow that up with a devoted multimodal ticketing proposal, setting a framework for fair commercial conditions to use the data and use them to offer integrated tickets that combine a train journey with other public transport or bike sharing service in a city. And such a system should allow operators to offer citizens what they exactly want, an easy to book train ticket to all, every part of Europe as part of a multimodal sustainable journey. And obviously within that framework, at least 15 quick connections uh, with no stopovers direct connections between the major European cities. That's our commitment that we will make happen this fall. And by coincidence, I mean, you might think European Commission, digital systems, that can only go haywire. Well, by coincidence, we had some practice with the green certificate, the COVID certificate that is now on almost, it's a bit of a discussion, on almost every iPhone designed, developed, and implemented by Europe, by the European Commission. We can do something right. And we will do this right this time too for, for ticketing. So finally, we have to ensure one more thing. We have to ensure that flying on short haul distances becomes a smaller part of our transport mix. In the Netherlands, the NS and KLM are already experimenting with train services that take the passenger on the short haul part of the route to skip all, and then obviously to New York or Singapore where, well, going by train is a little cumbersome. So we look at that with great interest because it might serve as an example. If that works and we should make it work, we should see if we can export that to all over Europe. Banning those flights is only one step, but it will never work. A ban will never work if there's not a better alternative available. And we see that all over Europe. There's countries that are thinking about considering banning or uh, increasing the taxes on short haul flights. They will only do so if there is an alternative that works and that is available to everyone. And there are, on many routes in Europe, if you look closely, there are conventional trains or fast trains that are even quicker door to door. If you obviously you have to take that into account than a short haul flight. So the sustainable choice can and should be the more comfortable and maybe also the more cheaper choice. So that's our offer to you today. And we are of course also working on more freights on trains, etc. but I don't have the time to go into that. We will steer investments into that direction. We will use also digital technology to make also rail the most reliable form of transport for carrying our goods across Europe. All of this stands and falls with a commitment that goes both ways. Our promise to help, and I repeat that today, but also the commitment from the rail companies and the member states to think European and deliver, deliver fast for our European citizens. 
Only that way we can be like Marty McFly and take the train back to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diederik, for your passionate um, talk about the trains in, in Europe. It was really, uh, really inspiring. Um, I invite Jean Foppe and Will to the floor here because now we have a uh, half an hour for Q&As and I think there are a lot of themes to be discussed. There must be a lot of, maybe you can stand over here somewhere there in the spotlights, that would be the best place. Uh, a lot of themes and maybe it's good to start with one uh, theme, that's a question we can ask Diederik. John, you started with that observation that uh, in China where you worked quite, quite a few times, you. Um, you were surprised by how quick and efficient those people can manage things. You mentioned that they can, can build complete high-speed train uh, lines, while in the Netherlands we only can adjust just one tiny thing. Um, and you were wondering how is that possible? It must have something to do with the, the system in China, but perhaps it's a nice question for Diederik. Maybe he can shed his light on this, because um, yeah, in the EU it's complicated, you have a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, a lot of differences. China is one big country. C could you shed some light on this Chinese efficiency, uh, Diederik? Yeah, it's actually a very um, simple and also sobering answer, or maybe it's actually inspiring. China is, lo is lacking two things, um, democracy and diversity. And we have those two things and we should cherish it. And obviously it makes our life much more difficult. It makes your life more difficult and it makes getting a train to somewhere almost impossible. But I wouldn't get rid of those two essential elements of a thriving society uh, for not for a million, not for a gazillion, not for a fast train track. So we have to do with what we have. Um, it's, it's a pity. No, it's actually good. And yes, the Chinese will win in speed. We will be more lucky. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I think that's a very nice answer. You, you can't see the people smiling in the audience, but I really liked your, uh, your answer, Diederik. Thank you very much. Um, I'll get the microphone, and then I'll check in the theater over here whether there are questions. Um, are there online questions? No, no online questions, but no, there must be some in the theater, who dares to ask a question? I come up upstairs, just uh, Does it have to be about this theme? Or sorry? Does it have to be about this theme? About this theme? Yes. About the railway theme? Yeah, that would be handy. <laughs> 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 Let me see, I'll switch on, just ask, ask your question and we will see where it lands. I think it's on, go ahead. Uh, thank you all for the inspiring speeches. Um, I was wondering, it seems a lot of the issues have to do with the power supply and there is maybe not enough power, there's all of the different power supply systems, and um, there may be also the issue with the high speed and that there's something touching the catch area's high speed. I was wondering, is there a spot for synthetic fuels in train travel and then synthetic fuels but also fuel cells and hydrogen? Um, and if there is, how far is that development? And if there is not, could you maybe tell me what the arguments against it would be? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, Will, shall we start with you? Yeah, I could say something about that. Um, well, general, general fuel cells and um, train, trains uh, d getting the energy from fuel cells is a, uh, generally a replacement for diesel trains. Uh, probably a very, uh, from, from an environmental point of view, a very efficient change in the energy supply. Um, as far as I know, uh, still, Electrical trains are the most efficient, energy efficient, environmentally efficient uh, modes of energy supply for, for trains. So, uh, as far as I know, there are, I don't know any examples of high speed trains that are ru actually running on fuel cells. I could imagine things like that happening, for example, in Siberia or something. So, Im imagine that you have quite a long stretch, you want a high speed train, you don't want to build an overhead wire. Uh, that might be a perfect option, a perfect solution. But as far as I know, there are in, 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 the, in the central European area, there are no initiatives for uh, high-speed trains driven on fuel cells. Mm -hmm. 
John, could you? Yeah, a bit very shortly because we'll set it all, I think. But we are do experiments with uh, hydrogen trains, also with battery trains, but it's all to replace uh, the diesel trains. Because uh, okay. when, when there's, a le there's a wire above the track, it's the most efficient, effective way, way, and we want to get rid of the diesel trains. And it's very expensive to get it all, all the, um, the wire be, uh, above the track, so then we use uh, the different alternatives. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should, could add something to that. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, there's an enorm enormous amount of, of diesel tracks still, and they are heavily experimenting on, on uh, bi mode trains. So that, that they are running on diesel uh, outside stations, so in, 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 the, in the urban areas, and whenever they come into the station, they run on batteries. Mm -hmm. That's all to make them more ev environmentally friendly because the fumes, you don't want to get these fumes in, 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 your, mm -hmm. in your stations. And Diederik, could you comment on this question? Because out of the Green Deal idea, there might be some new energy alternatives. Um, well, in short, e-fuels are hugely expensive and um, transforming that in uh, forward motion with an internal combustion engine is hugely ineffective. So that's two good reasons not to put it in a train where you have an alternative, which is an overhead wire. Uh, we should actually save e-fuels for transport modes that cannot be electrified or can hardly be electrified, which is long haul flights and maybe also ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a follow up question on this theme, because I think it's interesting and relevant. Um, how about the, the energy production for the trains? I believe in the Netherlands, 100% of the trains is running on wind energy. I could imagine that in France, 80% um, of the trains runs on uh, nuclear energy. Um, isn't that also, a very, I'm, I'm looking at Diederik in the first place, a very important thing to look at, Diederik, if you want to um, have a sustainable rail network, you want green uh, electricity, of course, to be used. Are you working on that? issue as well actually from the supply side so if there's the a demand uh, for green electricity by a specific operator he's free to do so and even advertise with it putting the ceo on a windmill uh, in a television advertising um so uh, that's fine but we work on the other side of the, of the equation which is the supply side and we know that by 2030 already 65 percent of our electricity will be green and by 2040 it might be 100 and that's actually the situation i mean if you have a specific amount of green electricity you can divert it divert it into the train but that means it doesn't go anywhere else um, so the only real solution is a full green electricity system and we will getting we will get there in two decades mm -hmm. okay and, and, and what, what will be the role of France in this picture? Because when I was in France, I saw a lot of nuclear power plants. Will they all be replaced by windmills? How does it work in, in practice? Question for a different studium uh, general, uh, I think. But yes, um, <laughs> we haven't touched upon uh, nuclear energy in the Green Deal. And uh, basically, that means that we leave it untouched, literally. So don't close them too fast. Don't open. Uh, for France, that means somewhere around 2030, uh, between 2030 and 2040, we'll, we'll see a lot of nuclear power stations come off the grid mm -hmm. because of aging uh, of their uh, systems. And yes, by then, France needs to power up using solar and wind. Uh, and they're already starting the preparations for that. Yeah, okay. Good to know. You had a question? I'm in the wrong row, but I found my question. There you are. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so going back again to the analogy with uh, China. So I I if you really want to be as fast and decisive like in China, wouldn't it be really uh, the only way to have a, a, a body, pro-rail-like body uh, on a European scale? A and maybe, I mean, in the longer term, we also maybe need these they have these very fast trains like this world record of 600 kilometers plus a separate uh, core network with these very high speed trains if you really want to compete uh, with air traffic and i think we really need to 
Interesting question. John, shall, well, I, shall, shall I start? Yeah, with please, the, I, please I started start. the China discussion. Eh, this yes, you did it. Yep. I did, I did. Uh, I, I, I think the first step is, is really, in my opinion, to go to this European timetable to do the ticketing and all the things we can do in the first 10 years. And I, I think Diederik explained about that. I, I heard his passion. And, but we need, we need Brussels, we need Europe to help us to make that first step in the, in the coming 10 years. And then the, the interesting uh, question comes up if you want to do that second step, because I really believe that everything be below 750 kilometers can be done, not on, on the current network, but we can modify the current network, we can change the technology, we can make adaptions to make it work for and be attractive for 750 kilometers, because it's also about comfort. If you can be in the train, stay in the train, have a direct train, you can work, you can do all the things. If we want to go further than 750 kilometers, then we come, I think, to the kind of changes uh, you, 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 you ask, and then we need a commercial model, or we need a European government which is more united because you have to do the, the huge investments in these high-speed uh, trains, uh, and it will be huge. Uh, and, and we see it also in the Netherlands. Uh, we, co we talked a little bit about uh, the corridor to Germany, the A12 uh, corridor. It, it's not only the amount of money you have to spend, but it's also that you need the space, because there are a lot of communities in, and you cannot make tunnels everywhere, yeah, you can of course, but then, then the end is it. So we need, really have, then we need a more European uh, uh, body, I think, to make it happen. So I agree with you, but that, for me it's not the first step because uh, it's further away. We can reach a lot within the 750 kilometers first, mm -hmm. I think. I, yeah. your, your answer reminds me of the, I think it was in Delft at the Technical University. They were experimenting with some kind of tube train, correct me if I'm wrong, with mm -hmm. a vacuum, a vacuum tube which goes i don't know how Hyperloop. fast it goes Hyperloop. 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 That, Hyperloop. that was it yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 those kind uh, are very interesting alternatives of course of future transport uh, what what are you doing with these kind of developments yeah we and uh, I first ask diederik you can uh, <laughs> you can think about it. diederik the hyperloop maybe you have heard of it in the TU delft it's some kind of tube post. Um, are those serious um, things to be investigated? What, what, what role does it play in your whole Green Deal infrastructure plan, these kind of future technologies? Well, actually, a fun fact, uh, before I took up my life and went to Brussels, uh, I worked two years in the private sector. One of them was, uh, one of my uh, hobbies actually was uh, to create that, or to help that startup uh, happen. So it's called Heart Hyperloop. Um, it's one of those crazy Elon Musk ideas, but um, how crazy he might be, a lot of his ideas see the light of day at, the, at some point in time. Uh, think about the rockets uh, landing back on Earth. Um, so it might be possible. I can't exclude it, and then we, we actually included it in our mobility strategy for the future. Europe is investing in it via uh, some of its uh, research and um, also venture capital money that even the European Commission has. And um, who knows? I mean, um, there's always that comparison that taking the train from Amsterdam to Hengelo took uh, two hours and 30 minutes in 1910, and it still takes two hours and, and 10 minutes. So it's a bit of a lack of innovation uh, and maybe a jump forward into a Hyperloop idea might happen. but. I, I suspect we will see those more uh, in the Middle East and again China first before building it in busy Europe. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Will and John, would you like to comment on the Hyperloop? No, I don't. Any further? No, 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 then we, no. we continue. No, we, to we get inspired by them, but, but, but we keep our innovations a little bit closer and wait. Yes, for yeah, yeah, I understand. There are a lot of questions here. Um, I'll start with you, and we have also online questions. We'll come to that. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, just as a heads up, I wrote my bachelor thesis on the ERTMS system and its implementation in Germany, and also work as a train test batcher in Germany. And um, well, I mean, the ERTMS solution you said is probably not the final solution for passenger transport, but with the system basically coming from the 1990s and being evolved in the last 30 years, now with its final implementation being headed for the 2050 something years, is that also only just the final solution for freight transport as well? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm very glad we took the decision in the Netherlands to have EATMS in the whole of Netherlands, because I believe in if you get that kind of system, you don't, you shouldn't make patchwork. You should make it in the country as a whole. We do the same as uh, Norway, as Belgium, and as uh, Denmark at this moment, mm -hmm. and also in Austria, uh, uh, they are doing the whole country. So it, it will come, and it will be on the international roads, uh, the, the 10T corridors. It will be also, and it will be for freight first, but it will also for passengers. It will come. And it will bring a lot, because it, 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 in the Netherlands it brings one very important thing, because it will bring capacity. It's not the only bottleneck, but it's one of the bottlenecks now to have more capacity. And we see if we can eat TMS, and sorry, I'm getting a little bit technical now. Yes, and, yeah, and maybe you, you could explain very briefly what is this for kind of system, yeah, the, or the is, it, is it complicated? It's another student generale problem. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me give it, let me give it one try, okay? So I don't spend too, too much time mm -hmm. on it, because we have more to discuss. But now we have an old system, to, to, to make safety happen in the Dutch railway system. It's from the, from the 40s, 50s, it's from the Marshall help after the World War II, mm -hmm. and it used old uh, uh, relay, relay, relay technology. Relay, yeah. relay, yeah. relay, yeah. relay, relay technology. Mm -hmm. And it means that you have, uh, let's put it very simple, 400 meters between trains. And you can only say stop or go. That means you have a limitation how many trains you can have on one track. Now, EATMS is a new system, digital system with computers with GPS uh, communication. So you can have, you can say a little bit slow, a little bit faster, and you can drive the trains closer. Mm -hmm. So you can have more trains. And it's easier to have automatic train operation so that you can drive without a driver. Mm -hmm. And then you get the people out of the system and then you get more consistent and you can even have more trains. Mm -hmm. Still understandable? Yeah, that's very okay. clear. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I first, I first go to this, you, you were first. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there are more questions. Yeah, just... Uh, oh, okay. Just um, I was standing in Berlin and the one train fell out and my whole journey was uh, not to Hengelo but to Munster and then I needed to be picked up by a car. What's here? Is there an initiative to get a guarantee you get home internationally? <laughs> so That's a good that's question. <laughs> there, there in the Netherlands, there's like a taxi yep. and that gives you... There is a guarantee in the mm -hmm. Netherlands, but you want a European guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good and very practical question. Um, yeah, it's, who, wonderful, to whom really it's a wonderful question. And, and, yeah. and I actually, yep. um, we've been debating that, that over and over uh, when in, in my time when I was with NS International. So j sometimes, you know, uh, we got delays imported from Belgium. And who's to blame for that? Mm -hmm. Uh, they would push over 500 people over the border and would we'll say, we'll say, good luck with them. <laughs> and what to do with them? You know, and of course, we sometimes we had stormy weather, you know, and we would store them in a, in a, in a gym or something like that. But, uh, you know, so we never got to an agreement how to, how to, well, we got to a couple of agreements on how to deal with that, but not financially and not on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, but maybe you're, I've got a better understanding of that. As far as I know, there are uh, no initiatives on that. So it's, it's merely local. Uh, uh, so that's that basically the train operating company you're traveling with that has the courtesy to bring you at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tried yeah. it uh, a long time ago when I was studying here, 27 years ago, I think then, or 26. I was on a Hengelo station and I took the wrong train and I ended up in <laughs> Oldenzaal and then the first stop. And then I learned about frequency of international trains because you have to wait a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the real answer is, because, because Will is right about the taxi system and how to do it, but I think if we can put up the frequencies, and it's, it's possible technically to have more trains to Berlin, mm -hmm. then it would be less of a problem because you could take the next train, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and finally to Diederik. Uh, Diederik, uh, um, is the EU working on this? practical but very uh, yeah, real problem of, of getting home um, <laughs> after your international, uh, after your European train trip? No, but it would be a step in the uh, development of, uh, of, of an adult system of train operators. Uh, because with flight operators, uh, there's actually many more flights and therefore passengers stranded on airports than there are trains stranded somewhere. Mm. And somehow the all those um, flight operators know how to, to solve that issue. Um, and if they don't, you take a different flight operator next time. And that should also be the system for, for uh, Europe. We, ca we can't have a European-wide bring you home system uh, uh, 
uh, like yeah. that. So yeah. no, we'll we will oblige the train operators to do so. But Diderik, it wouldn't be, but what, it, it's, why, why not a European manifest on passengers' rights that, traveling by train? And that's, that's one of the things we, we're going to, to develop, including this, but that will be a burden put on you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, there are more questions, but we have also have an online question um, by Etty. Etty, thank you for sending uh, your question. Um, it's a very basic question, but I think it's a good one. Um, why are train tickets often more expensive than a comparable, comparable distance flight? So why, why is it, and it's, it's, it's way more um, a cheap a flying ticket. Why, why is that the case? What's, what's, what's the reason? Does it have to do with taxes or? or yeah, it has to do with taxes, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, f f first of all, uh, flights don't pay fat. Uh, planes don't pay uh, taxes on, on kerosene. 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 No. Uh, and, and trains pay, of course, fat on electricity or whatever means of energy they use. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is, of, of course, there is something like, like yield management, you know. Uh, very often, uh, because it's a patchwork of in Europe still, um, imagine if, 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 the, if a train company can sell a ticket for a better price because there's a high demand, um, it might happen that they do that. And if that, that train is just in your trip, and Thales does it, Eurostar does it, e ICE, so DB doesn't do it as far as I know, but uh, so th these, these, these international train operators, Thales and, and Eurostar, do yield management. So sometimes big tickets are more expensive than, than at other moments. So not every moment is as attractive to travel. So if you want a cheap ticket, travel early. If you want to pay the biggest, highest price, go at nine o'clock in, in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm. And th there was a follow-up question by Etty. Uh, is this expected to change soon? So when will the prices be balanced or when will the train become even more cheap? I think uh, uh, train operating companies are basically commercially driven operations. They got, of course, the, of course there is, a, there is a, a society benefit in them, mm. and of course they are, are very important for societies, but, but in the end they've got to earn some money. And um, mm. I guess that, that, that's probably the reason. Uh, they have, their balance sheet has to be Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. but I, th I think John already mentioned it, the, um, the taxation of kerosene, it's, it's non-existent in the EU. Mm. Um, that's a question for Diederik perhaps, um, to, to pressurize from, from out of the European Union eh, to, and to stimulate the whole rail traffic. Uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to have some taxes on kerosene or is this a silly question? Uh, they have it in other countries, I believe. Um, why, why are you working on that as well, be, to balance it a bit more? Yeah, we actually uh, proposed it on the 14th of July. Oh, okay. uh, it's in the Energy Taxation Directive. Parliament and Council have to agree with it. Uh, and then we have taxation on kerosene. And not only that, we will also bring uh, domestic flights within Europe um, under the ETS, the Emission Trading System. So they, they have to buy EU allowances to fly and uh, emit all that CO2. So we will create... Uh, Oops. I think Diederik is um, um, a bit of a... Yeah, Diederik, are you still with us? <laughs> are you there? Yes, uh, we, we are still so. here. You, yeah, you're back, yeah. P please, could you repeat the last sentence because we had some glitches in the connection. Are you still with us? Yeah, I have a long delay. Oh, okay. Um, but no, I, I'm, I'm here, uh, here. What I said is I doubt whether creating that more level playing field is going to make all the difference. I also uh, uh, note that the heavy competition in air transport also led to lower prices. And that heavy competition is not present in train transport at the moment. I'm not sure whether we want it to be present, and that's a dilemma, because we know that with heavy competition, the prices will go down. We also know that heavy competition on something like rail is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. 
we understood it uh, loud and clear. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I have a question on uh, the sort of European first and, and local or national second that, that you talked about. Because um, here we have Will from NS International and then you are the vice president of this European Rail Association and of course Diederik from the European Commission. And also here and in this sort of UT bubble at the, at the local elections, the, the campus turned purple. So in my own bubble, there is a very clear uh, international and especially European orientation. And I wonder where is that missing or what is in which specific places are holding back this European focus before the national focus? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's, yep. uh, um, first of all, I think it's just a paradigm shift. We just do it this way all the time. Like in the Netherlands, we always, uh, till this summer, when the new infrastructure was ready at Zwolle, we always start uh, developing the timetable at Zwolle because that's one of the bottlenecks. So it's just a habit to do these kind of things that way. So first of all, I, I think it's just a paradigm shift, but it also brings up real questions. We, we know that we can in the future uh, get more trains from, um, from, uh, from Amsterdam and Utrecht to, um, to Frankfurt. Uh, but then maybe we have to skip some stops of the, uh, the cities in the morning uh, traffic, traffic rush hours. And uh, then it's the question, what do we want? Do we want more international trains or do we want those passengers from those stations to be transported in the commuter trains? Or, and I think this option is now getting more and more available, mm -hmm. can we do what the international trains do also in the domestic area and we can make price difference that those people who travel on this track in the domestic trains uh, get, a, get a lower fee if they go one hour or two hours later. That, that was very difficult to discuss in the Netherlands uh, politically mm -hmm. before COVID, but now w that we had COVID and we had all these discussions about starting times of universities, of companies, I think it's more open to have this kind of demand management then we can make easier decisions. But you see in the Netherlands, for example, one of the most difficult things to talk about a mayor or, uh, or, 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 or one city is talk about, oh, you're not an intercity station anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it, I should it's never try it. It's highly sensitive. It's highly yeah, sensitive yeah, too. But sometimes it's yeah. from a national perspective or from an international perspective the best thing to do. But people are, yeah. uh, it's so important for the city. So it's a difficult discussion, but demand management can make the change, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you agree, uh, Diederik? Yes, I do, but it's a bit of the same dilemma that we just discussed on hard market values versus public values. Uh, and actually you want, uh, on a national scale, we treat trains as a public service uh, and we have a public service agreement to make that train. And within that public service boundaries, you don't want a big price differences because you know who will profit from those big price differences who have all the choice in the world to go at whatever time they want to travel. It's the people with a lot of money. And the es essence of a public service is that it's available and accessible for everyone at every possible time. Mm -hmm. So that's our dilemma. If we, if we want to stick to our public principles, like with diversity and democracy, we add an other uh, barrier to fast developments. Mm -hmm. um, with democracy and diversity, uh, I don't have a question. As I said, not for um, all the money in the world, I would give those up. With a public service, you, you might diversify between national and international. We might come to a time where my grandchildren will, will treat international tra transport as a public service. I think for now we should treat it as uh, one of the options to travel together with uh, flying, which is also not a public service. And there you can have price differences, etc. But for national, I would be hesitant. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> it's difficult to debate like this, I think. Y yeah, you would like to comment on... Well, yeah? well I, I, I do fully it understand because I know, mm -hmm. I know how sensitive it is and how difficult it is to... to, to but, but if you come to a choice that you have a certain amount of, of, of money and you have to, to, to make the choice that you have uh, new, new, new houses built, and uh, are, mm -hmm. are we allow all those people to take the car or do we take this kind of measures mm -hmm. together? Uh, to make it happen for less money. It's, it's, get, it's get a really difficult discussion. I've, and I think it's one of the, could be in public debate, these kind of discussions, I think, right now. Because it's, for me, it's not that principle. But of course, Diederik is right. You should be careful about it because it's a public service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. 
completely concur. This is not an easy dilemma. Also, public goods have a scarcity. And if you want to divert that scarcity, money is or at price differences is um, an option. And we use it in some public services too. So it's not forbidden. But I would, as I said, I would be hesitant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one qu question about the European uh, countries. Um, I think it's for Diederik the question. What, what, what's, what, are, what are really chauvinistic countries? So countries, <laughs> and maybe it's a bit dangerous question, but there are countries who are really international minded. I think the Netherlands is one of them because we're so tiny, I suppose. Uh, but I could imagine France and Germany are a bit more chauvinistic. Uh, uh, Diederik, do, could you say something about this problem in Europe? Uh, maybe no, it's, uh, it's live streamed. So uh, no, 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 it's difficult to simplify. But you just did uh, countries with a lot of uh, foreign worlds because they're tiny themselves, mm -hmm. have more international. Yes, countries like France, but also Spain and Germany and Italy tend to think that their system is the best in the world. Yes, and that's yeah. why those bloody French took so long to adopt uh, European systems like ERTMS. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a clear comment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, here's a question. Yes, I heard those letters U N T S again and again, but I still don't know what they mean. Yeah, John, could you the the, the E R M T S? I think. E R T M S. E R T M S. European Rail Train Management System. European Rail Traffic Management System. Traffic, traffic Management System. Traffic. European Rail Train Traffic, traffic Management traffic. System. Is it a ticketing system? No, no, it's no, not so. it's a It's a safety system, and it uh, gives the train clearance to drive, and uh, when the other train is coming, it makes sure that two trains cannot come in the same track. Yeah. The ticketing system still has to be developed. Are there any more online questions? Okay. We go to the final question, and then we have to round off because it's 9 o'clock already. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, concerning the problem of uh, skipping stations on international trains, isn't it, or is there an initiative to uh, make a uh, uniform uh, uniform yes yeah uniform yeah. standard set of rules uh, international city uh, <laughs> intercity stations should um, you can ask in Dutch if you like. Yeah. Then <laughs> okay. Um, dat een uh, intercity station zeg maar een bepaalde uh, waarde moet hebben. Dus 200.000 man moet in die regio wonen. Zoveel kilometer van de vorige stop. Dat je uh, niet gevallen krijgt zoals Almelo, Hengelo, <laughs> Bad Bentheim, zeg maar. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, nou, dit is een very intriguing question about the highly sensitive intercity stop discussion. How do we deal with this? Yeah, we, 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 have, we have rules about how many people get on and off the train to define the kind of station and also the kind of facilities in the station. So mm -hmm. that's the normal way to do it. Mm -hmm. But you see, especially on international trains, uh, uh, sometimes you have hard decisions to make. And we saw it also with uh, uh, the, the international trains will go to Belgium on the high speed uh, track. Yeah, you, 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 you want to have a certain uh, travel time and then you need to make those kind of decisions. And mm -hmm. th those are sometimes arbitrary. You can't, you, you cannot really uh, amount, you cannot always uh, um, predict how many people will be on. So it's, and it's always a big discussion, also a political discussion. High sensitive, uh, Diederik would uh, say, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, also, if you look at the train for Berlin, you, uh, we, we, we couldn't skip some stations. But it's, 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 it's also, uh, if, you, if you skip those uh, stations in Germany, it's on one hand, it's good because you, can, you have less travel time. But on one hand, a lot of the... Uh, local people use that, that train, so you get also less people in the train. So mm -hmm. it's, it's quite mm -hmm. a difficult afweging. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, it's a consideration. Sorry, my Con English is hey, <laughs> considera it's a very difficult consideration yeah. and, and mm -hmm. balance between all kinds of right, factors. I imagine, well, you know, I, I used to be responsible for the Benelux train, mm -hmm. where the Benelux is running from Amsterdam to Brussels. You mm -hmm. know, that's the, the old train, right? Yeah. Not the high speed train, the present yeah. high speed train. But uh, we, stopped, uh, we stopped, basically, we stopped in The Hague. Uh, we stopped in Rotterdam, of course, uh, uh, in Dordrecht, uh, in Rosendaal. Uh, and this train, it was probably the, the, the most densely crowded, populated, highly populated. Uh, we had an average, average usage, usage rate of something like 80% or so. 80% of the seats were taken 
the entire day, Four on minutes. average. So this was, it was a money, money machine for NS International, but it was a very, very important connection between basically the entire Romstad. Um, and, and now it's, it's the high-speed train to, uh, to Brussels, and it stops in Schiphol, and then the next stop is uh, Rotterdam, then the next stop is Breda, and it will cross the border. Uh, time travel has reduced over an hour, I think. Mm -hmm. So well, that, that's an example of the benefit of quick traveling, but uh, skipping quite a lot of stops. And that, that's basically, that's always an issue. Always an issue with local communities, with mayors, with uh, mm -hmm. governors from the, for, of the province, uh, whoever ca can get, get involved will mm -hmm. start to, to, to try to influence that. Yeah, yeah. Diederik, uh, for you the final question, what, what do you, how do you notice this dilemma in, um, in Brussels, and this, this yeah, fight for the intercity stations? Could you say so a bit on this? Uh, for us, it's not a dilemma, it's a, a no-go area. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't try and tell Austrians what an important city looks like, and then go to France and, get, and imply the same criteria onto them. <laughs> it's a completely different world. Uh -huh. So, no, no, don't go there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Diederik, for being uh, present online. Um, we're going to say goodbye to you. We, we're rounding off this, uh, this session right now. We're ending also the live stream. Uh, Sean and Will will be in the theater. So, if you have any more questions, you can come afterwards to, uh, to Will and, uh, and, and John. But, Diederik, thank you very much for your time, for your passionate talk. You got a very big hand here from the audience, also from our digital audience. Thank you very much for being so passionate about this, uh, this topic and uh, we wish you very good uh, luck and success with the important Green Deal you are organizing uh, from, from over there. So thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you and good luck with your work. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye Diederik, bye bye. Okay, um, that was Diederik, it was very nice we had him uh, online uh, uh, present. I also want to like to thank John Foppe and Bill van Roy for their very um, excellent talks. I think it was a very good build up in the evening. You started with the, the, the uh, Amsterdam uh, Roma Termini train and all the nostalgia and then you continued on it and Diederik went on. So it was a very good, good build up. Thank you very much, I all wish you a lot of luck with solving this huge European train puzzle and maybe in the future we'll, yeah, when you're booking your ticket it would be del an, a, a delight when you have an internet website where you could just book a ticket. When I prepared this program I wanted to see how long it took to go from Amsterdam to Rome by train and you could find it, 22 hours, and then I wanted to know well, what does it cost and then they, you click a button and they say please ring the international uh, office from, from NS. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to do this. This is going to take hours. So, hours. Um, so that will improve, of course. Um, thank you very much. It was an intriguing evening. And um, good luck with this very huge puzzle. Thanks a lot. A big hand. And thanks for the TV. Can I have my... Yeah.